thanks for that reading. It's good. Um, so before we go to the Lord, uh, uh, before we uh, unpack the word, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, just um, just want to thank you, Lord, for what you have done um, in this conference. I just pray that you will continue to, to do your work through your spirit. Father, as I proclaim your word from 2 Timothy, uh, especially from chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, I pray that um, you will help me to be faithful to your word. And I just pray, Lord, that um, indeed these words may not just be letters on a page, just ink on paper, but spirit, Lord. We want these words to be impressed upon our hearts. And only you can do that. Only the Spirit can do that. So, Father, this is our last time in, in the morning. So I just pray that, that you will just give us something that we can, that will just uh, leave a lasting impression upon us. Something that we can take home. Something that's not just emotion or hype, but it's just something, a truth that will last for the rest of our Christian walk and also in our ministry. So, Father, I pray that you will be gracious to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Okay, so um, I know that we just read from uh, chapter 3 uh, to chapter 4, verse 8, but my main focus will be 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, because I know that you guys have been working very hard through chapter 3, and you guys have been reading that passage over and over, so... The main focus will be chapter 4, verses 1 to 8. And in this last talk, um, I want to begin with this question. What's, what's the last thing you think you would say to your loved ones just before you die? Okay, I know um, you guys are young and can't really imagine that. But imagine that you are dying on your deathbed, that, you had, um, that you're about to die, and your loved ones, your family, and your friends are around you. What would be your will, your dying wish, your last instruction before you depart to the ones closest to you? Of course, it will be the, the most important thing, isn't it, to you? You want to leave behind to the, lo the loved ones the most important thing. And we see that uh, to Apostle Paul, the most important thing... Um, sorry, I'll just... Um, yeah, so in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see that the Apostle Paul is about to die. We see that in verse 6. It says, For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. Okay, so um, as I mentioned in the first talk, it seems that Paul is waiting for a death sentence to be pronounced against him at any moment. Okay, he's in prison. Okay, he, he doesn't know what's going to happen. Uh, but he, he, he knows that, that death is near. Things are not looking well. Okay, so, so Paul is writing this letter as kind of his will, his, his testament to his protege slash disciple Timothy. Okay, and the most important thing to Paul, the very last thing that he wants to say to Timothy, Paul's very last charge to Timothy is this. Preach the word. Preach the word. Look what Paul says in verse 1. And two, in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Okay, so there are, we see that there are many imperatives or commandments or commands in verses 1 to 5. In fact, there are a total of nine commands. Or imperatives in verses 1 to 5. If you look at that, reprove, rebuke, exhort. Okay, And it says, be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. But all those commands fall under the umbrella of this first command. It is an elaboration of this first command. Preach the word. Okay, Preaching the word involves rebuking. And reproving, preaching the word involves enduring and suffering. Okay, preaching the word involves um, 
being sober-minded, having a sober mind. Okay, so for the rest of this talk, uh, I want to ask three questions about this passage. Why does Paul want to want Timothy to preach the word? When does Paul want Timothy to preach the word? And how, in what way, does he want Timothy to preach the word? So, firstly, why? Why does Paul want Timothy, and by implication, us? Okay, especially those those of us who are like past Timothy in Christian ministry as, as church leaders. Why does he want Timothy and us uh, to preach the word? Okay, there are two reasons. But first of all, it's simply because it's a divine mandate. A divine mandate because it is simply what God wants of us. And that should be enough. Look what it says. In the presence of God, I give you this charge. Timothy, preach the word. Okay? And what Paul means by that is very simple. Paul is giving this last instruction, this charge, this commission to Timothy on behalf of God. In other words, it's not just Paul, a mere human being, who is giving this charge to Timothy. It is God himself who is giving this charge to Timothy merely through the agency of Paul. So as Christians, especially as those of us in Christian ministry, we also must preach the word. And by context, we know that the word here is the scriptures. By word, by preach the word, Paul means preach the Bible. Because just before he says this at the end of chapter three, as you know, Paul was just talking about the scriptures, right? He said, All scripture is breathed out by God and and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I charge you in the presence of God, preach the word. Okay, so uh, preach the word means to preach the Bible. Okay, why should Timothy and we do that? Simply because God says so. God says so. It's a divine mandate. It is a command given to us from the throne room in heaven. This is not man's wishes. This is the edict of the king. Okay, so we must preach the Bible. Don't preach anything else. Preach the word because simply that's what God demands of us. Okay, but let's get a bit more specific. Why does God desire this? Why? Why does God want us to preach the Bible? Well, we see in verse 1 that we must preach the Bible because Jesus Christ, the man whom God has appointed, is coming back, coming back very soon to judge every single human being who has ever lived. Look what it says. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing and His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Okay, what Paul means is, okay, in light of the fact, in view of the fact... Given the fact that Jesus is coming back to judge everyone who has ever lived on this earth. In light of that reality, you, Timothy, and you, Christian, must preach the scriptures. Why? Because without Jesus, apart from Jesus, every single human being is going to be condemned to eternal death on that day of judgment. That's what the Bible says. That human beings were born under the wrath of God. By nature. Okay? And the only way out of that judgment is by believing in the message about Jesus, his death and resurrection for sinners like us, to which the Holy Scriptures testify. We saw that in chapter 3, verse 15, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So that's why we preach the Bible, because the Bible points to Jesus, the Savior through whom we are saved by faith in Him. Okay. In other words, by preaching the Bible and Jesus to whom the Bible points to, Timothy's job and our job on this earth Why are you here on this earth? It is to prepare people for judgment. That's what it is. Telling people that the only way that you are going to escape on that day is by what? Surprisingly, by trusting in the judge. 
You've got to trust in what the judge did for you out of his love for you the first time he came into this world. He is the judge, but he is also the savior. Okay, so to sum it up, we must preach the word and preach Christ, the savior to whom the word points to. Or simply put, we must preach the gospel. Okay, we talked about how gospel and word are interchangeable for Paul. We must preach the gospel because simply it's a divine mandate and because there is a day coming when Jesus is going to judge everyone. And we've got to get people ready for that day, for that dreadful day of the Lord. That's our mission. Get people ready for judgment. Okay, so let's move on to the, to the when. When? When should we and Timothy, sorry, Timothy and we preach the word? The answer is always. Always, all the time. Look at verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. What does Paul mean by that? In season, out of season. I think John MacArthur summarized it the best. He said, um, The faithful preacher must proclaim the word slash gospel when it is popular and or convenient and when it is not. When it seems suitable to do so, and when it seems not suitable, the dictates of popular culture, tradition, reputation, acceptance, or esteem in the community or in the church must never alter the true preacher's commitment to proclaim God's word or the gospel. Okay, that's a great summary, isn't it? Whether it's popular to, to, to do so or not, whether it's trendy to do so or not, whether it's convenient to do so or not, whether it's suitable or not, whether you will be accepted by people and other Christians or not. We must always preach the gospel, preach the word, always. Okay? Gospel preaching is like a fruit that's in season all year round. Okay? There's no such thing as a gospel preaching season. Okay? It's not just on Easter we preach the gospel. It's not just Christmas time we preach the gospel. Good Friday. It's all year round. All year round. All the time. Which means here's the, here's the implication. Here's the application. Okay? There, is a, there is never a time for you when you can say, Oh, it's not yet time for me to preach the gospel. It's not yet time or I'm not, re- I'm not yet ready to preach the gospel. I'm not ready today to preach the gospel. Because how many times have you said that? How many times have you made excuses? Oh, I'm not ready yet. I'm not yet ready to preach Jesus. I'll do it next time. I'm sure I'll have another chance to talk to that person. Or you may have said, oh, you know, that person doesn't look like he or she is ready yet for the gospel. How many times have you made excuses like that? But look what Jesus says to your excuse. He says, do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. They're ready. But you see, you don't see that because you're not looking up from yourself. You're not actually seeing. See the field. Look at the people. They're lost. Stop saying, I'm waiting for the right time because any time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming is the right time. As I said, this is the last days now. Now is the harvest time. The fruit is ripe for picking now. And the only, the only reason we don't see that is we're not lifting up our eyes from our own stuff. Okay? Of course, we may not be ready, okay? Because of our distractions, our selfishness, and honestly speaking, our lack of love for people. We just don't care about people going to hell. But the gospel, the word, is a message that's always ready to go out. It's ready to go out. Are you? Okay, there is no off season for gospel preaching, like you know, in the NBA or, or like other sport. You got the off season and the on season. There's no such thing. Got to do it all the time. It's an activity that's always in season. So why this urgency? Why? 
Why must gospel preaching be an activity that's always in season, all year round? Because we just talked about in verse 1, Jesus is coming back at any moment to judge the living and the dead. He could be coming back in 20 years time, 10 years time. Five years, we just, we just don't know, okay? I don't care what your eschatology is, okay? Don't fool yourself thinking it can't be tomorrow. Jesus said, I am coming back like a thief in the night. What does that mean? It means that pe- Jesus is returning when people are most unsuspecting. It could be tonight. We just don't know. That's why we must preach the gospel, the word in season and out of season all of the time. Okay, and this applies to me as a, past, as a pastor. There is never a time when I can say, oh, you know, I think I'll just preach the gospel next week, next Sunday, next month. I think I'll just preach Jesus you know, later, next time. It's not yet time for me to preach Jesus. Okay, there is never a time when I can say that. Every single Sunday, I am commanded by God himself to preach the gospel, Jesus, to the sheep, that he has placed under my care. Okay, every Sunday I must preach Christ. Every Sunday. Who Christ is, what Christ has done, what Christ has taught us. We must preach the gospel. Why? Because we forget the gospel every week. Every morning you wake up, you forget the gospel. That's why you've got to do your devotions every morning because you're preaching the gospel to yourself every day. So every single week as a pastor, I have to recall the gospel to them because those sheep they need to listen and believe the gospel afresh every single week okay as we talked about the gospel is the 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 fuel that gives us the motivation the strength to live our lives for god right it's the gospel of what jesus has done the gospel of what jesus has accomplished for us on the cross that causes thanksgiving in us which Uh, which gives us the endurance to keep living a life that pleases the Lord in every way. It's the gospel. The gospel is the fuel that keeps our spiritual engines running. So I don't care if I sound like a broken record to people in my church. I don't really care. Okay, of course, I try to play different variations of the same tune, but it's always the same old tune from me. And you know what that is? That Christ came into this world that he lived a perfect life that we could not live. And he died the, dirt, the death, the cursed death that we deserve. And he rose again from the dead, defeating death. That's the same old tune that I will sing as long as I have breath left in my lungs. Okay, so let's move on to the how. How or in what way, in what manner should Timothy and we Preach the word, preach the gospel. Well, Paul says that Timothy and we must preach the gospel, the word, with complete patience. It's a bit interesting, isn't it? Complete patience. Look at verse 2. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reproof, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. Like, why would Paul tell Timothy... To preach the word with complete patience. Why is that in there? Well, you've got to read the next verse. Okay? Read. The very next verse tells us why. For, okay? Com- preach. You need patience, Timothy. Why? For, because the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. This is why Timothy needs patience, because there is a time coming when the audience of his preaching will become very, very, very difficult, when people will not endure sound doctrine. Okay, what is sound doctrine? Well, in the context of this passage, Sound doctrine is just another way of saying the word, isn't it? Preach the word, but have patience because there will come a time when people will not endure sound teaching. Okay, so it's just another way of saying the word. So sound doctrine is just 
biblical teaching, teaching that is based and according to the Bible, teaching that is based on the whole counsel of the Bible. Okay, not just picking bits and parts that you want, okay, that you like, but the entirety of the Bible's message, the entirety, the true gospel. Okay, so what Paul is saying is that there will come a time when people will not endure, or the NIV says, when people will not put up with the Bible, biblical teaching, teaching that is based on the whole counsel of the scriptures. Why is that? Because, okay, let's, let's face it, right? reading the Bible uh, sometimes is not a very comfortable experience, is it? It's not very comfortable. Sometimes it's very convicting, uncomfortable to, to really listen to the word of God. Okay, just, just go home and just read one of the Old Testament prophets like Jeremiah. Uh, Amos, Ezekiel, like it's, you know, what? It's, it's like when I read it, it's like every verse is painful to read because it's like, that's you, that's your sin. And it's like, it feels like a thousand knives just cutting away at my heart. Just read, just go home and try reading Jeremiah. Okay, it's heart surgery and surgery hurts. Okay. Because you see the many, many times the word of God is against us. The Bible does not support many times what we are doing. The Bible opposes the things that we are doing. The Bible opposes the choices we are currently making in life. It frowns upon our thoughts, the intention of our thoughts. The Bible keeps correcting us and rebuking us. And it keeps warning us that if you continue walking in that path, you will eventually be judged by God if you do not repent. Okay, so it tells us how much we need a savior, how much we need Christ. Okay, so it's a very uncomfortable and humbling experience to read the Bible. So Paul says that the Bible or teaching from the Bible is something to be put up with. You need to endure it. Endure it. Okay, like like a piece of impure gold has to endure the fire of the flaming furnace in order to become pure gold. It hurts. I know it hurts. But you got to stay in there to become pure gold. To become more and more shaped into the image of Christ, the Holy One. Look what it says in Jeremiah 23 verse 29. Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? Okay, so the question, whenever you open up the Bible to read it, whenever you listen to truly biblical teaching is, are you ready to be burned by God's word? Okay, are you ready ready to be roasted by God's word? Are you ready to be smashed By the hammer that God's word is. Are you ready for the hammer of God's word to break your heart and your sin and your selfishness into a thousand pieces? Are you ready? That's the attitude with which we got to read the Bible. Get ready to be burned. Get ready to be smashed into a thousand pieces. Well, if you say, well, you know, I'm not ready for that. I don't want to be burned by God's word. I don't want to be smashed into a thousand pieces. Or if you say, well, you know, sometimes if I'm really honest with myself, I just can't stand God's word. I can't stand it. There are certain bits in the Bible just makes me want to cringe when I read it. There are certain bits in the Bible that just squirm in my seat when I read it. It's like, it's, it's almost embarrassing. It's, it's almost like I got to hide that portion of the scriptures from so that my non-Christian friends don't see it because it's so embarrassing. It makes me want to rip those pages out of the Bible because they make me feel so uneasy. Are you like that? If you are like that, you have to ask, why are you like that? Why am I like this? Why can't I put up with the whole counsel of the scriptures? Why can't I endure biblical teaching, sound doctrine? Well, to answer the question, you have to look through 2 Timothy, the book, and ask, okay, what kind of people 
do not endure sound doctrine. What kind of people cannot handle the whole counsel of the scriptures? Well, Paul tells us what kind of people in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 to 5, which you have read. Okay? It is these kind of people who are turned off by the Bible. These kinds of people. So if you are, okay, be honest with yourself. If you are turned off by the Bible, if you can't stand the whole counsel of the Bible, then ask yourself, am I like this? As described in this passage. Look what it says. But understand this, that in the last, time, last days there will come times of difficulty for people will be lovers of self. Lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, that is pride, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness, but denying its power, avoid such people. Is that you? Does that describe you? You see, this passage is very interesting because it's a sandwich. Do you see the sandwich? Inclusio, they call it. You see, in the middle section is the meat that is sandwiched by two breads, two kinds of loves. You see that? Verse 2, the first bread says, People will be lovers of self. Self Self-lovers. And then in verse 4, the other bread, piece of bread says, rather than lovers of God. So that means this whole passage is a description of people who love themselves more than they love God. In other words, it is a description of people who worship themselves as God instead of God. Self-worshipping self-lovers. Look at it. Why Why do people love money? Because money buys you stuff for yourself, right? Why are you arrogant and prideful? Because you love yourself more than God. Okay, why are you ungrateful to God? Because you just, after you do an achievement, you pat yourself on the back and you say, well, I did a really good job there. I thank myself for my own achievement. I am God. I am in love with myself. So the list goes on, okay? So everything in this list happens because you love yourself more than God, because you worship yourself as God. You are your own God. So Paul is saying that in the last days, which is now, by the way, we are in the last days, many people, okay, and in the context here, look at verse 5, having the appearance of godliness, okay, people... Um, who go to church, even people who go to church, even people who claim to be Christian and on the surface level who look like Christians, church goers are going to be like this on the last days. Church goers, people who love and worship themselves as gods. Okay, so link this with chapter 4, verses 3 to 4. This is what Paul is saying. Okay, if you're a person who loves self more than God, If you're a person who worships self as a God, you will not endure the Bible. You will not put up with the Bible. You will not endure with biblical teaching. You will not endure with the whole counsel of the Bible. Why? Because the Bible everywhere is always telling you to love God above yourself. Deny yourself. Take up the cross. Follow me. It's repeated over and over in the Bible. So if you are a worshiper of self, you can't handle that, right? You can't handle it. So you reject it. The Bible is always pointing you to Jesus, that God so loved you and sent his only son to die for you. So now you owe him everything. You you owe him all your love, all your devotion, all your worship. Why? Because Jesus on the cross loved you more than himself, didn't he? But if you reject the gospel, if you reject this call of, to repent of your self-love and self-worship that is included in the gospel, then Paul says you will not endure the Bible. You will hate the Bible. You will be put off by the Bible. You will squirm every time you read the Bible. Okay? And then eventually you will walk away from the Bible to something else. It says, 
Time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate, accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Okay, what Paul means here is that these self worshipping self idolaters, these self lovers, will accumulate for themselves teachers that tell them, hey, it's okay. It's okay to love self more than God. It's okay to love money more than God. It's okay to love pleasure more than God. Why do these self-worshipping, self-lovers do this? Why do they accumulate these teachers? Why? Because they need to suppress their own conscience. They got to suppress the truth because their conscience is screaming at them that they have to love God above everything. So, so they got to suppress it. How do they do that? They gather people who will lie to them to their ears. Okay, people who tell them, hey, there's nothing wrong with you. You don't need to change anything about yourself. That God actually wants you to love yourself and money and pleasure more than anything. That, hey, God actually exists to give you those very things. Money and pleasure and self-esteem, self-love. Okay? And the more teachers you have that tell you these things, the better. Okay? You need lots of voices. Why? Because your conscience is screaming from the inside, so you've got to suppress it. So you need more and more and more voices okay, to kind of become your headphones. Okay? You remember when you were a child, okay? your, your parents were nagging you okay? and telling you to do something that you knew in your conscience was the right thing to do, but you didn't want to listen to it. What, what did you, do? you went to your room and you shut the doors. And you put on the earphones and you put the volume up louder and louder and louder so that you can't hear your parents anymore. Okay? Those earphones are like the false teachers. To shut out the voice of God. To shut out the screaming voice of the conscience from the inside. Okay? So what do these false teachers teach? Of course, they don't teach the Bible. They don't preach Jesus. I mean, sure, okay, they quote the Bible, okay? Why? Because they got to sound Christian, you see? They got to sound Christian. So they give, they quote a, bi- a few Bible verses here and there that are not like out of context, unrelated. Okay, they give lip service to Jesus. Okay, they sprinkle a few mentions of Jesus here and there, kind of like salt and seasoning. But Jesus is not the main meal of their teaching. Okay, he, he's not the, the bacon and the eggs of their teaching, okay? He, you know, Jesus is just like a little salad on the side. A little optional extra. It doesn't really matter if he's in there or not. He's not really at the, the heart of their teaching. That's how they treat Jesus in their teachings. So what do they these false teachers serve up as the main meal? What is the main meal they serve up? Paul says, myths. Okay, when we talked about myths many times in this conference, but you see another thing I want to talk about myths is that they're essentially stories designed to entertain people. Because they're stories. Entertainment. That's what they give people. So people turn away from listening to the truth. They turn to teachings. They try to sound Christian by sprinkling Jesus here and there but are nothing less than actually they're just entertaining tales designed to tickle your ears. Okay? Um, one time I was talking with my friend. who told me about these two pastors they have at their church. Okay, one pastor, the older pastor, is, you know, the very studious type. Apparently, when he preaches, this pastor, the older pastor, goes verse by verse by verse. I've been there to, to that church, so I know how the, the pastor preaches. You know, he's a bit dry, and he just, he just, you know, he's the kind of pastor that sticks to the text. That's what you get away after you listening. You're like, okay, he, he really sticks to the test. But then in his church, there's another pastor. He's a younger pastor. Now, this guy, um, apparently he's a really funny guy, okay? He tells a lot of jokes on stage. Okay, everyone just like laughing and laughing and laughing throughout the sermon. You know, it's like watching a stand-up comedian for 40 minutes. Okay, he's dynamic. He's jumping up and down. He's going to and fro. Okay, the aisles, I know because I, I've been there. And that's, you know, he's, he's moving. 
Now, take a while to get which one is more popular, do you think? Which one of the two pastors does this church love more? Of course, they love the stand-up comedian. They love that guy. Whenever the older pastor preaches, they think it's, they say it's boring and dry. But when the, 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 the second pastor preaches, everyone thinks that it's like the best thing ever. That's what they say. It's like the best thing ever. And my friend would get frustrated. They say, how can people be like this? How can they just love jokes and humor for 40 minutes, being entertained while thinking that having the Bible explained to them is boring? Okay. I think it just reveals what's wrong with our churches today. Okay? We just want entertainment. Okay, we're just so driven by our culture that worships entertainment as supreme. The Netflix culture, right? We just come to church with the same mindset. I am here to be entertained. Okay, we don't really care about the word itself. I mean, just think about how at the end of each sermon, the only thing we usually remember about the sermon is just some little funny story that the pastor told. That's told, right? Some little side tale the preacher told that doesn't really have anything to do with the text. Why is it like that? Well, you could say, well, that's just the way we human beings are wired. We, we love stories. We respond to stories. And I get that. I understand that. I'm not saying we shouldn't use stories in sermons. But I think sometimes it's simply because we're just not paying attention to the preacher when he is explaining the Bible, the text itself. Okay, we, we just switch off during the actual exposition, the explanation of the word. But, but the only time we switch on is when the guy just t- tells some, some silly joke that doesn't actually have to do with the text itself. Okay? It's because we come to church with this attitude. I'm just here to be entertained. Okay? The preacher is just a comic, a stand-up comic who just stands there, who, who exists, who, who is hired by the church to thrill me for the next half hour. Okay, because that's how we've been discipled by our culture, isn't it? We've been conditioned by our self-loving, pleasure-loving culture that that's the attitude with which we come to church to worship. Okay, we don't really want to be confronted by the God of the Bible. So what, you know what we do? We hide, we take cover behind those silly, stupid little jokes so that we don't actually have to, to listen to what the preacher is saying. But still, at the end of it, pretend like you did. Right? This is not a new problem. Coming to church just to be entertained. This has been going on for centuries. Okay, Prophet Ezekiel faced this problem of people just coming to church to listen to him only for the entertainment value of his sermons. Did you know that? Look what God said to Ezekiel. Chapter 33, as for you, son of man, your people who talk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses, say to one another, each to his brother, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come and they sit before you as my people and they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths, they act. Their heart is set on their gain. So there's no transformation. And behold, you are like to them, one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful, beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument. It's just entertainment. For they hear what you say, but they will not do it. Also, look what God said to the Israelites in Isaiah chapter 30. And now go write it before them on a tablet and inscribe it in a book that it may be for the time to come as a witness forever. For they are rebellious people, lying children, children unwilling to hear the instruction of the Lord, who say to his seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us smooth things. I can't stand the rough things of the Bible. Speak to us smooth things. I don't like those edgy bits. The Bible, cut them out, round the corners. Prophesy illusions. Give us myths. Leave the way. Turn aside from the path. 
Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. I don't want to hear anything about God. So you preach, just to select texts that, that just tell me about how much God loves me. The soft bits. Okay? But I don't really want to be confronted by the God of the Bible. Don't give me God. Right? So you, you got to ask yourself, is that what we are doing when we're reading the Bible, or when we're listening to biblical teaching? Do we just want to hear the smooth things? Can't you handle the rough bits of the Bible? Okay, think about what kind of sermons you listen to in your podcasts. Do you just listen to preachers that you want to hear that make you feel good? Think about what kind of Christian books you read. Do you just read authors that put you at ease? Or do you also read authors that challenge you, even disturb you, to get you right with God? Think about the friends you have. Do you just surround yourself with people who just affirm you and admire you all the time? The yes men, the yes women? Or do you have genuine Christian friends who will gently and lovingly rebuke you when you don't walk on the right path? Or do you just avoid those kind of people? Because you just want the smooth stuff. You can't stand the rough things, the bits that tell you that you are wrong, you're incorrect, so that you just pick and choose whatever passage you want to read that speaks to you, okay? or you just don't actually read the Bible for yourself at all. Okay? Ask yourself, in your reading of the Bible, do I love myself above God? Right? Going back to chapter 4, verse 5, Paul tells Timothy, be sober-minded, In your ministry. Why would he say that? Because Paul is concerned for Timothy. He's like, I'm worried for you, Timothy. I know, I trust you. I know who you are. You know, I trust you as much as a man can trust another man. But Paul is concerned that maybe, maybe if Timothy is not careful, he may also become like one of those false teachers who just tell interesting, funny, emotional tales to just attract the crowd. Okay, because... You see, in our ministries, in our serving in the church, it's so tempting, isn't it? It's so tempting to avoid preaching the whole counsel of the Bible, to avoid preaching Christ alone and Him crucified. Why? Because not many people listen to you. All right? Why? Because that's exactly what Jesus said would happen. He he said that if you preach Christ alone, preach the truth, you will be rejected. Okay, and when that happens, or people don't listen to you, it's very discouraging. So you know what, you know what happens? It's, it's, you become tempted to tweak the gospel. Let's tweak it a little bit. Tweak the content of our preaching and just tell people nice little funny jokes to entertain the crowd, to give them what the flesh wants. Give them what their evil hearts want. You see, that's how you grow your church in numbers. If, you, if that's all you care about in your fellowships or your church, I'll tell you how you grow your church or your fellowship in numbers. Okay, this is how you do it. Tell people how awesome they are. Just tell them you're awesome. You're awesome. Nothing wrong with you. That if you come to Jesus, you will have a relatively comfortable and easy life. Okay, you don't have to go full, full Osteen. Okay, you can just, the, the softer version, you can just have a, a relatively easy life. Relatively, with relative success in business and relative success in family. And plus heaven at the end of it all. Wow, who wouldn't want that gospel? That's how you grow your churches, in numbers. Okay, just give them that garbage, that cancer. Just keep giving it week in and week out and do it for six months. Do it for six months. I, you know, I guarantee you will grow in numbers. It's just giving people what they want to hear, isn't it? So the temptation is always there to just tell people what they want to hear. And you see, that's where the pastor or the leader has to endure suffering. It's the suffering of majority of people of your audience not listening to you or even walking away from you because you are faithful to the true word of God, the true gospel. You see, we always have to remember the parable of the soils. The parable of the soils. Jesus said, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. And when he sowed, some seed fell along the path, along the path, 
and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, immediately sprang up since it, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell on the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, he who has ears, let him hear. Okay, what Jesus is saying in this parable to sowers, okay, you are sowers. If you're, in, if you're serving, if you're in ministry, you are a sower. What, what Jesus is saying to the sowers in this parable is majority of people that you preach the truth, the gospel, the word to will reject the gospel or will ultimately prove unfaithful or unresponsive to the true message of the gospel. Kind of like three out of four failure rate. Three out of four failure. It's not, of course, this is not like exact statistic, okay? Three out of four. But still, what Jesus is implying is that majority of people that you speak to, the gospel will reject it or prove unfruitful in the end. What he's saying is you will face more failures, more negative results in preaching the true gospel than positive results. That's what he's saying. So Jesus is saying, he's, he's, this is what he's saying to you. Expect negative results. Expect many negative, negative results. Expect many fruitlessness. Expect it. I'm not being pessimistic. Because the, the point is, if you don't expect negative results, if you don't understand what he's saying here in this parable, the gospel will fall on deaf ears the majority of the time, kind of like three out of four. You know what's going to happen? You're going to be tempted to edit the gospel. Let's tweak the gospel. Why? Because I want to force more positive results. I'm going to water down the message to draw the crowd. I want to get more positive resu- results. And so Jesus is implying to us here, Don't you do that. Don't do that. Leave the seed alone. Leave the seed alone, okay? Don't crush the seed and throw it. Don't don't tweak it. Leave the message alone. Okay, I was talking to my wife. My wife was saying, you know, it's very easy to grow tomatoes. You know what you do? You eat the tomato, get the seed, you wash it, just throw it out. That's what you have to do. And it just grows by itself. Hey, don't, don't interfere with that, okay? Tomatoes grow. The seeds are powerful, okay? It's like the gospel. Leave the message alone. When there's fruitlessness, when people reject the gospel, the problem majority of the time is not with you unless you've been a total hypocrite, okay? Majority of the time, it's just with people's hearts. It's not with the seed. All right? You know, I saw this quote. I end with this, right? It never left me. The gospel is ours to proclaim, not to edit. But why would anyone want to edit the gospel? Why? It's because they want to go beyond what Jesus said. They want to go beyond what Jesus already predicted in his word. That many will reject the true gospel. And they can't stand that. They can't stand it. Right? They want more positive results than what Jesus promised us in this parable. They want four out of four success rate. Right? So they twist and change and water down the message into a one that more people will likely respond to. See, don't you realize that's how people end up becoming heretics and false teachers? It's this... Desire to go beyond this parable. I want four out of four success rate. I don't like this three out of four failure rate. I want everyone to respond positively to my message. I want lots of people in my church and fellowship. So I'm going to compromise on the truth. I'm going to tweak the gospel. Take away sin and you know all that negative stuff. The rough edges. Give them the smooth things. Yeah, and then you will have success, but not unto eternal life, but to eternal death. You're preaching a false gospel. You've become a heretic. 
Okay, so let's preach the word. That's the last thing that I want to say. In season, out of season, preach the word as it is. In its unedited form. Leave the seed alone. Like tomato seeds, just throw them out. Just throw them out. Don't tweak it, okay? The gospel is ours to proclaim, not to tweak. Okay, proclaim it expecting negative results. Don't be discouraged. He already said that you're going to fail many times. He already told you that you will fail. So when you see fruitlessness, when you see people leaving the church, don't be as discouraged. Yes, you've got to still love them and care, but don't be as discouraged. Don't go into despair. Oh, is this something I said? Something I did? Many times it's not. It's just simply this word coming true. Stop forcing it. Just throw out the seeds. Expecting negative results. And when you do, okay, you will have that one good soil of the fall. Produce grain. Growing up. Increasing. 30-fold. 60-fold. 100-fold. And it's the minority. But you've got to be satisfied with that. Be content with that. Even if you do an evangelical conference, only one person puts up his hand. I want to commit my life to Jesus. That's what that whole conference was for. The one soul. It wasn't a failure. Stop thinking like the world. Right? Stop tweaking the gospel. Just proclaim it and leave the results to God. Okay? When you've, you see, for sowers, when you've thrown out the seed, you've done your job. You've done your job. Saving is not what you do. It's what the Spirit does. Your job as a sower is to just throw it out. Okay? And live it out as best to your ability by the help of the Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, I just want to thank you so much for your word. And Father, as it says here, Lord, that the, the word is ours to proclaim, not to edit. So, Lord, we just want to be faithful sowers. Keep us from that temptation. That we want to force positive results that you never promised in your word. And so go off and change the, the message. Water it down. Remove the rough edges. And thus we are removing the offense of the gospel. So, Lord, help us not to do that. As people who are in ministry, people are serving... Help us to just proclaim the word. And when we have done that, we've done our job. And the results are up to you, Lord. You do the saving. You do the work of changing hearts. That's not our area. It's not my, our department. So, Father, I just pray, Lord, that you help us to be faithful, to endure suffering. When we, when we do see people... Walking away, Lord, we know that it's hurt. it hurts. People with no fruit, it hurts. But Lord, help us not to forget what you all have already said. And to just keep going. For those few. As you have said, when one sinner turns because of the word, there is a party in heaven. Lord, help us to not forget that. To care about single souls. Help us not care about numbers, but single souls who will bring joy to your heart when they turn to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.